Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I believe most of you know me, but for those of you that do not, I'm Neil Doherty. I'm the Chief Financial Officer here at Keysight, and I have been since the time of Keysight's spinoff from Agilent uh, back in 2014. I'm here today to talk to you about Keysight from a financial perspective, but specifically giving you a little bit of a longer term view in terms of what you can expect from Keysight moving forward. I'm going to focus my comments today on four key themes. First, Keysight is a business that has been and expects to continue to compound returns on behalf of investors. Second, we believe we have an increasingly resilient financial model that positions us well to, to outperform in a variety of macroeconomic circumstances. Third, we'll continue to leverage a consistent and disciplined capital allocation framework that balances investments to drive the continued organic growth of our business with investments in M&A and return of capital. And finally, we're continuing to raise the bar on the financial expectations for this business as we move forward. So let's start by look, take, taking a closer look at our financial performance. And as you can see, both since our spin in, in late 2014 and since our last analyst day in March of 2020, we made significant progress in transforming our financial performance across a wide range of important financial metrics. Over this eight-year period of time, we've grown our revenues at a 10% compounded annual growth rate, improved our gross margins by 850 basis points, our operating margins by over 1,100 basis points. We've grown our free cash flows at an 18% rate and our EPS at a 17% compounded annual growth rate. A couple of other comments. First, you know, focusing on that 10% compounded annual growth rate for key site revenues. I think it's underappreciated how balanced our growth has been over this period of time. Not only is Keysight grown at a 10% compounded annual growth rate, but both of our operating segments, uh, CSG and EISG, share that same 10% compounded annual growth rate over this period of time. Second, focusing on that margin improvement of 1,100 basis points, certainly a great result. But most importantly, we didn't do it by mortgaging our future. We actually grew our operating margins by 1,100 basis points, while at the same time, more than doubling our investments in R&D and more than doubling our direct sales force, positioning us well to continue to grow into the future. And so we do believe that the company is positioned not just for continued growth, but for continued margin expansion, strong cash flow, strong cash flow generation, and to continue to compound earnings on behalf of investors. Before I move forward and talk about kind of the longer term financial expectations for the business, I did feel it was important to address the current macroeconomic environment. Obviously, it's a little bit uncertain time that we're in at this point in time. But we believe that there are, that there are important and unique elements of Keysight that enable this business to outperform in a variety of macroeconomic circumstances, including the circumstances that we find ourselves in today. And that confidence comes from the structural flexibility that we have built into our cost structure. It starts with the fact that 100% of our employees, from the executives in this room all the way down to the folks that are working on our manufacturing lines, have a portion of their pay that fluctuates with Keysight's business performance. The, true driver, the two drivers of that, uh, of that variable pay are our organic revenue growth and our operating margin level. And so should we enter a macroeconomic environment that puts either of those under pressure, I have a systematic and automatic way to reduce spending on the single largest component of my cost structure, which is our people. Beyond that, approximately 50% of our manufacturing is outsourced, 20% of our sales flow through an indirect channel. We make strategic and significant use of flexible staffing. And again, all of this gives us a systematic and automatic way for our cost structure to respond to changing macroeconomic conditions. It gives us confidence in our ability to outperform. And unlike the last time we were here, three years ago, when I talked about the same cost structure flexibility and the same model, the model has now been put to a real world, world test. That real world test came via the COVID pandemic. Back in Q2 of 2020, we were forced to shut down our, our, our manufacturing production and stop shipping to customers. In that particular quarter, our revenues shrunk 18% versus the prior year, but we still delivered 19% operating margin, which, is, which was a decline of just 500 basis per points versus the prior year, actually outperforming the model that you see in front of you. For the full year, our revenues were down 3%, but we actually grew our operating margins and grew our EPS for the year. 
Beyond that, we believe our business is more resilient than it's ever been. You've just heard from Mark about the 33% of our business that comes from software and services. We've talked earlier about the, the increasing portion of our business that is sold into our customers' R&D labs versus their manufacturing lines, and how we believe that that is a more uh, resilient sale over time. In addition, we've heard from Kailesh and from what he said about the strong secular growth drivers that exist across a broad cross-section of our industry, which will, while not providing total immunity from macroeconomic conditions, certainly provide a significant buffer. In addition, we have a strong and flexible balance sheet, generate strong free cash flow, and we entered this fiscal year with over $2.5 billion of backlog, which positions us well as we enter this period of uncertainty. Now let's take a quick look at that balance sheet. I think the number one point here is this business is, is in a very strong liquidity position with over $3 billion of available liquidity, including $2.2 billion of cash and an undrawn revolver. We also currently enjoy low leverage with just one turn of gross debt to EBITDA, which is a full turn below our long-term target of, of two times. We believe this balance sheet is appropriate for this, this macroeconomic environment and over the longer term provides us with strate significant strategic flexibility. So now I want to move forward and talk a little bit about what we, you can expect from this business as we move forward. And I think the number one point that I would like to make is that we remain committed to the same operating model that we have now been discussing for the last eight years. And that's an operating model that calls for this business to deliver 40% operating leverage when we grow a business mid single digits or better. When we grow our top line, we have a high degree of confidence in our ability to continue to expand margins, both gross margins and operating margins. And when you're growing your business and expanding margins, you would expect to continue to have strong free cash flow conversion. Then it becomes a question of how do we deploy that capital on behalf of investors to continue to drive further value so that we can continue to compound earnings. So now let's take a look at each one of these, starting with the top line. As you've already heard from Satish, we're increasing the long-term growth expectation for this business today to 5 to 7% moving forward. And we're able to do that because we believe the underlying markets we serve are actually growing faster than we previously communicated in a couple of areas. As you heard from Kailesh, we now believe because of the investments that are happening in the U.S. aerospace defense modernization and the commitments that our allies, particularly in Europe, are making to spend on defense at a higher percentage of GDP, as well as the investments that are happening around space and satellite, that those aerospace defense and government markets are now growing at 3 to 4 percent versus the 2 to 3 percent that we communicated previously. And within EISG, the commercial adoption of electric vehicle technology and autonomous driving, as well as the investments that are happening uh, around the world to, uh, in terms of digitization, the semiconductor content that that's driving, and the investments that are being made in regions around the world to assure uh, semiconductor supply, the, the electronic industrial markets are now growing at 4 to 6% rate versus the 2 to 3% that we had communicated previously. And so, our markets now at the key site level, we believe, are growing at four to six percent. And key site remains committed to outperform market growth by one to two hundred basis points annually, which enables us to deliver that five to seven percent growth expectation. If you look in the lower left, you can see how that how this has played out over the last three years. Since we were last here in March of 2020, we believe the market grew at 5% and Keysight grew at 8%. So the market grew at the, high, at the high end of the previously communicated market growth range of 3 to 5%. And we actually outperformed the 1 to 200 basis points of, of market outperformance, outperforming the market by 300 basis points over that period of time. Again, when we grow our business, we have a high degree of confidence in our ability to expand margins, both gross and operating margins. And that ability to grow gross margin starts with the ongoing and sustained favorable mix shift that we've been seeing in our business really over an extended period of time. We continue to see an increasing portion of our business uh, coming from both uh, R&D and operations. Today, a little bit more than a third of our business is, is in the manufacturing side of the business, but I would point that out that that's based on FY22 numbers when there was very significant investments happening in manufacturing as the, business, as the technology space was dealing with the supply chain constraints of the last 18 to 24 months. 
33% of our business coming from software and services, which not, not only increases uh, the margins and, 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 and that, but it increases the durability of our business because a significant portion of those revenues are recurring in nature. We believe our strategy itself has components that help us improve our gross margins. When you are first to market with software-centric solutions focused on the R&D customers, those, that is differentiated that can be monetized. And, is, and what we often find is the, the complete solutions that we're bringing to the markets are, uh, come with a significantly higher gross margins than the core instruments that we've traditionally brought to the marketplace. And as many of you know, we have select vertical integration, which provides us with both a cost and technology advantage in the marketplace. Beyond that, it comes down to execution. We're constantly working to drive productivity across our organization. Three areas of focus currently, driving uh, in increased productivity in the sales force, continuing to leverage our, our low-cost GNA infrastructure, and then focusing on our supply chain. I think supply chain is an interesting topic. Over the last 18 to 24 months, this portion of our team has been singularly focused on product delivery, getting products into the hands of our customers. Now with the supply chain situation starting to improve, we can once again turn this, team, uh, this team's focus to the cost side of the equation and continue to put additional uh, efforts into improving our gross margins moving forward. Again, when we're growing our business and, and, and improving margins, we expect to deliver strong free cash flow. You can see here in the upper right that this is a business that over the last three years has averaged a billion dollars of free cash flow. Free cash flows did decline in FY22, but that was solely a function of the pressure that was put on working capital as a direct result of the supply chain disruptions. And as you can see, we expect to get back to strong free cash flow growth here in fiscal 23. When we think about how we're gonna deploy that capital, first and foremost, we're focused on continuing to fund the organic growth of our business. We do that first through the R&D line, and we continue to believe that investing in R&D at approximately 16% of the revenue is the right level for this business. We will also continue to visit, invest in our sales channel and capability, not just capacity, but strengthening our software capabilities and our e-commerce capabilities to continue to drive revenue. Beyond that, the management team has, has a strong desire to put money to work via value accretive M&A. We believe it's an important way for not just us not just to bring technology into the company, but for us to expand the markets with which we serve. And I'll talk a little bit more about M&A here in just a minute. And then beyond that, we're active returners of capital. Satish announced earlier today that our board has recently approved a new $1.5 billion share repurchase authorization. We're committed at a minimum to continue to offset the dilutive impact of our equity-based compensation programs. But as, as you've seen from us in the recent past, we're often much more active in the, in, with our buyback program than that. And we continue to believe in the long-term opportunities that exist for Keysight and that we can create value by investing in our own shares. So moving forward to M&A, as, as you heard from Satish, we've done 20 M&A transactions uh, in, 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 in the eight years that we've been an independent company. And those, those transactions aligned well with the, with the secular growth themes that are driving our business. Commercial communications, next-gen auto, auto, quantum computing, uh, uh, software test. Uh, and so we, we, are, we are looking for targets that really align with both our strategic and financial filters, uh, financial criteria that we have set for, for M&A. From a strategic perspective, we're looking to expand our addressable markets. Satish outlined today earlier $5 billion of, of adjacent SAM that we found of interest. We're looking for, for targets that have high software content or high recurring revenue that expand our portfolio of high value added solutions or augment our talent and solutions capability. From a financial pr perspective, we take a long-term view of value creation through M&A, recognizing it can take time to deliver, uh, to deliver value. ROIC is the primary metric that we use when evaluating M&A targets, but we're focused on ROIC in year five, again, taking a long-term view of value creation. Our ideal M&A target is one that would be accretive to our organic growth rate, as well as to our gross margin. We do use, uh, look at both revenue and cost synergy opportunities when evaluating M&A targets. We look at our large global sales force, our manufacturing footprint, our leverageable GNA infrastructure as significant points of synergy capture uh, for Keysight when evaluating potential transactions. 
So at this point, I've talked about our ability to grow our business, improve margins, generate cash, how we intend to deploy that cash. And so now let me tie that together and highlight what we believe are our new, uh, our new operating targets for this business as we move forward. I've already talked about the new 5 to 7% growth rate, which is up 100 basis points from, from, the prior, from the prior model. We expect to continue to drive gross margin improvement, reaching 66 to 67% uh, over the coming years, while we drive operating margins to 31 to 32%. And we're going to do that by continuing to deliver 40% operating leverage on mid-single-digit growth while delivering EPS growth that is 10% or greater. So I've covered a lot in a short period of time. But really, there are four things that I want you to remember from this discussion. First and foremost, Keysight has been and expects to continue to compound earnings on behalf of investors. Second, Ours is a resilient business model, and we are well positioned to outperform in the current macroeconomic environment. Third, we have a disciplined capital allocation process that balances investments for organic growth with M&A and return of capital. And fourth, as you've just seen, we continue to raise the bar on the financial expectations for this business.